Hello and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. My name is Chris Muntz and this is episode 25, Loving by Letting Go. This episode is unique because it's kind of the first purely human interest story episode that I've chosen to do because I think this person's story is interesting on a human level for many of us choral directors because I think we'll all be able to relate with some of the journey that she's been going through lately. Uh, Her name is Dr. Jacqueline Johnson and I think many of you might be friends with her on Facebook because she's so open with her story on Facebook and on Instagram. I encourage you to follow her if you aren't already for a lot of the reasons that you're going to hear in this upcoming episode. Dr. Johnson is a a fantastic clinician, an excellent musician, has been teaching at the collegiate level for a few years, the high school uh, level for years before. You'll hear her talk about that. The reason I bring it up now is that she did something interesting and unique that many of us uh, would not have the guts to do, and that is that she left the profession for a period of time to go and just explore the world and explore herself. So she loved and loves the choral profession and teaching and and directing choirs, but she was able to make a decision that in order to love it at even more fully, I'm going to have to leave it for a while. And so she took off to Brazil and did yoga. Like, who doesn't want to do that, right? So that's a pretty cool story in and of of itself, and we're going to dig in a little bit. When I say we, uh, something else exciting coming up on this episode is I invited Beth, my wife, to co-anchor this episode, which you'll hear us both grill Dr. Johnson on some questions that we have about her decisions and her what she's learned during this time uh, of exploratory journey that she's gone through. The reason I asked Beth to join us is partly because I like hanging out with her. She's fun. And the second reason is Dr. Johnson is a mutual uh, friend of ours. So uh, I thought that was a natural extension. We both know her, so it'd be fun to just get da- get uh, back together online virtually and chat and catch up, which was lots of fun. So I hope you enjoy that. Before we get to the conversation with Dr. Johnson, I want to give some shout outs to uh, the sponsors of this episode. First and foremost, I'm going to welcome and continue to thank Voce Vista for coming on board to the show. Here's something I want to share with you today about Voce Vista. If there was a way for you to prove to your students whether or not they were singing the correct vowel, and you didn't want to be the one to tell them, meaning you don't want to be the bad guy, if there was a way for them to see in the moment and then hear after the moment exactly what vowel they were singing versus the one they thought they were singing, and you can just stand there and smile and watch them figure it out. Well, that's Voce Vista. I've been doing that for two or three years in my classroom and in my private voice lessons, and it is a revolutionary technology. Uh, You're going to be hearing more and more about that over the course of the show, but what you can do in the meantime to try it out and play with it a little bit, you can actually download it for free and use it for a month as a trial by heading over to vocevista.com backslash Coralosophy. If you choose to go ahead and buy it, which you will if you play with it, uh, then you can enter the Coralosophy promo code and get 10% off. Uh, Also, helping us out on this show would be Graphite Publishing. Graphite Publishing is an awesome sheet music vendor where if you need the music now and you need to be able to search through their awesome search engine to give very specific criteria, like I need this piece to be for two-part tenor bass, and I need it to have a violin accompaniment, and I need it to be super easy. Okay, click, 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 boom. They've got the pieces that they have available for you that meet that criteria. It's a it's the best search engine on a publishing site that I've seen. Uh, really, really convenient, especially if you're like me and you procrastinate every once in a while on sheet music. Uh, so those sponsors are awesome, and you can uh, with Graphite you can also get 10% off with using the promo code Coralosophy. So check them out and uh, and throw some business their way. Helps the show out. But honestly, these are folks that I use. They're good people, and they know their stuff, and they're they're products that help me every day. So I hope they'll help you. All right, we're uh, we're here with Jacqueline Johnson on the Coralosophy podcast, and I'm really excited to have a get a chance to sit down with her and catch up on her latest adventures. My wife Beth and I uh, have known Jacqueline for a while, so I, we've got, we're going to double double grill Jacqueline today. Welcome <laughs> to the show. Hi, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to talk with you both. Well, good. And I can we can see that you're in a car, which I was mentioning before we were on air, that that makes a perfect sound booth. So we're going to all have a great listening experience today, which is great. <laughs> um, so Jacqueline, Jacqueline, for those of you, um, you 
that don't know who you are, those are the listeners that don't know who you are, would you just give us the uh, the rundown of your uh, the, your musical background and choral background? Sure. I was born and raised in Southern California and spent most of my life there. I went to Chapman University, Cal State Long Beach, um, et cetera, uh, Mount Sac, and grew up in that area and became a choral musician, taught at Murrieta Valley High School, where John Vine used to teach. And then um, after I, I, my choir sang at the Western Division Conference, I think it was 2010, and then the National Conference in 2011, and I had accomplished a lot of goals like touring and everything, decided I wanted to go get my doctorate and teach college. So I went to the University of Michigan with Jerry Blackstone and then taught for a few years at um, the University of Tennessee. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, that's that's awesome. And uh, one of, the, of course, Beth and I came across uh, Jacqueline through uh, the Contra I Summer Choral Institute. She came out and just did a rock star clinic for a week with us, which was just awesome. The kids loved it. So and of course, ever since then, we've been uh, keeping in touch and following you on your social media. You're very active <laughs> with telling people your your yeah. story. And one of the things that intrigued me uh, over the last year or so was just that you have taken some time away from the classroom. And uh, and it kind of gone on an adventure. Tell us what that's been like and how long that's been. Yeah, I had I had a few things happen just in uh, my personal life. Uh, you know, separating from my husband and going through a divorce. And between that, um, just that was really exhausting. He's a wonderful person, but um, it took a toll, and I just got really burnt out uh, from life. And I was very tired and didn't have the energy to give my students anymore. Uh, I really noticed that it was a huge shift from one semester being absolutely phenomenal to another semester, just being completely exhausted to the point of almost not even wanting to leave the house. Mm. And so um, I really turned inward and focused on my own personal uh, well, mental wellness and health and my physical and mental health. And um, it really dove, dove into yoga in particular. And that really changed my life and uh, changed my focus, um, I didn't realize how much of my musicianship was actually about me. I'd always heard about teachers saying how much they, you know, we teach students through the music, and it's always about the students. And, and I loved my students, but in a weird way, I, I almost didn't understand it. I just really loved the music. And I, by stepping away from music and the classroom, I realized how much of my music making was about me making myself feel validated and my love of music being validated by, by, by making music with other people. I know that sounds weird, but I wonder how many of our, of our teachers actually realize that's what we're doing. We're, 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 we're everything is, uh, a lot of things are based on making us feel better. I started realizing that my resume was about myself, building my resume, uh, even, you know, my conference presentations, I presented it, uh, I, think, I think it was four different division conferences uh, one year, uh, 10 conferences I presented out in one year. And I was, I mean, that's a lot of travel. And, and it became about building my name and, uh, and what was the next thing I could do to get myself out there. And um, when I switched to yoga, so I, I decided to go to India um, to get certified in yoga. I'd been taking yoga for years and I went to India and, uh, really loved it. Met people from all around the world who traveled the world, living abroad for months or years on end. And I said, you know, what? that's something I've always wanted to do. So I got online and went, moved to Brazil for four months and taught yoga there. And I just returned back from there. But what teaching yoga has taught me is how to flip the script and make everything about the student. It's absolutely when I do that, I, I, it's separate from my music making and I can focus on uh, the experience of the student. And now that I'm shifting back into, cl- you know, going whenever I clinic, whenever I do honor choirs, excuse me, whenever I do honor choirs, uh, et cetera, um, I'm finding that my shift has changed, has changed back to the students where it's supposed to be. Mm. Can I ask you what specifically about mm-hmm. yoga made you switch your shift more towards the students? Like what specifically about yoga caused that to happen? I realized how much in my life was, uh, I was about my own personal validation from my relationships and friendships. 
Um, a lot of things that I, I surrounded myself with, even the way I, I ran my, my, my home, you know, uh, how clean it was, my own personal space, everything was about making me feel comfortable and safe, mm-hmm. which is one of our fundamental characteristics as a human. Just because of uh, previous life experiences, I needed to feel safe and secure and in control. And yoga put that in my face. Uh, saying, this is what you're actually doing in life, my dear. It's not about the music. It's not about the students. It's about you. Let's start addressing that issue so you can actually start being a better human and giving back to the world instead of taking from Mm -hmm. it. Do you feel like that came about because of the kind of the natural um, focus on meditation and reflection that comes along with yoga and, and that these are things that just you realized during the process? Absolutely. Um, it's a, it's a huge focus of mine now. And I think it's a shift in society. Um, I started to realize why I started to think about why I was unhappy. I didn't always know I was unhappy, but I was always seeking something, seeking, uh, accolades, seeking achievement, Western American society, it, we base uh, our, a lot of our worth on our achievements. What have we done to be a productive member of society? And that's how I love myself, by other people saying that I'm worthwhile. And meditation, the goal of meditation is just to be present. Um, it's, it transcends religion. So you can be any religion to meditate, but it's being present in the moment and knowing that you are a worthwhile human being simply because you exist, not because of the things you do. Hmm. Do you think that was also, that also happened partly because of your experience just living abroad and living with different people from different cultures and experiencing a different lifestyle for, for that period of time? Do you think that was also part of the reason that that transformed you during that time? Yeah, a lot of my transformation was through a yoga program here in the United States. Can you hear me? Uh huh. Yes. Okay, great. Um, through my, through my yoga studio, Renegade Yoga Center in Knoxville, uh, and I have a wonderful teacher there, Philip Clift. Um, but a lot of the the re- the realization of my grip on c- needing to control things came about by living in Brazil. Hmm. I volunteered at a huge hostel and I was constantly surrounded by 50 to 60 people at a time. Um, and I, I literally slept in a little tiny shack with bunk beds. And so everything I owned was sandy and dirty and mildewy. I had no personal space, no, no personal time. Um, you're always surrounded by people. And it just, I, I realized how many things I used to make my feel safe, like my own space, my own cleanliness, my own, you know, how many things I owned, Mm -hmm. everything was about control and safety. And speaking of that, um, did you, did you feel safe being a woman alone in a, a strange place? Or did that come gradually once you kind of got used to your surroundings? Uh, a bit of both. Um, yeah, I, that's the thing about when I went to India, I met these 22, 23 year old young ladies who had been backpacking by themselves through India for eight months. Mm-hmm. And I asked the same question, aren't you afraid? Are you nervous? You hear of all the horror stories and they say, no, you just, you learn to be smart. Don't walk down an alley by yourself at night. Um, dress, you know, dress to the culture, uh, 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 do honor to every wherever you are. Be aware of your surroundings, and um, that is, I think, another thing that Americans don't do. We're so afraid of all the bad things that could happen that we we present prevent ourselves from going out and living. How many people do you know in the America in American society that have backpacked through Europe for months on end? Very few nowadays. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course, you turn on the news, and uh, all you hear about are all the bad things that might happen to you. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of per- sunk into our whole, our whole self, you know, and, and of course, especially, I think there's a, um, it's probably even a little bit different for what well, shouldn't, shouldn't even say probably it's definitely very different for women, um, to, to of what you're, what women are taught that they need to be afraid of. And so I'm, I'm very impressed that you were <laughs> brave enough to go off and do that. That's pretty mm-hmm. amazing. What would, thank you. How would you do? Well, I mean, 
I worked on a fish <laughs> boat when I was 19 <laughs> in Alaska with like ex-convicts and crazy. Oh people. my gosh. So I kind of can relate to that a little bit. I mean, I, we were living, you know, four people in a tiny bedroom and no personal space working 16 hours a day, gutting fish. And it was scary. And it was like definitely the biggest culture shock because I grew up as a, a young naive kid in Idaho, you know? And so that, that was very transformative for me. And, but it taught me a lot about myself and it taught me like that people, people are just people, you know, and like, we don't need to be afraid of people as much as we are, you know? Mm -hmm. And it it gave me a a really um, a valuable life lesson, I would say. And so like I hearing you talk about your experience was like, like I can kind of, I can kind of relate to that in some way. So yeah, it was really cool home. to watch you. Yeah. That was, it was really cool to watch your experience through Facebook and like we were trolling and stalking you. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved all of your, well, the things you shared. And I, I loved hearing your experience with like, you know, the worms and the, <laughs> just the like parasites. the parasites. It's, and it's so cool though. It's awesome. I just, Oh, did you so get cool. sick? I might've missed that. No, no. She'll have to share. Oh yeah. So tell the worms. I got, <laughs> Oh, well, I got, yeah. or maybe you did get sick. I don't know. <laughs> well, I got, I got sick all the time. I mean, uh, this little Western body is not used to tropical, uh, colds. <laughs> and so about every three weeks, you know, in, in, in Latin American culture, we touch each other all the time. You know, you're, you know, kissing on the cheek, you know, every good morning, long hugs, you know, you know, just petting each other's hair. Mm -hmm. And so you're always uh, sharing germs. And these people are from around the world coming through this hostel, like a, like a rotating door. Yeah. And everyone's wonderful, but I would get a cold about every three weeks. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And while I was there for four months and three times I got these parasites that are in the sand that dig tunnels in your skin. It's just disgusting. And it's no big deal. You just go to the pharmacy and you say, yeah, Bijou Geographico, that's what they're called. And you just put some medication on it and it's gone. But this is things that I was freaking out about when I first got there. And you just become eh, second nature. Wow. I'm going to jump in real quickly and give a shout out to two more sponsors for this episode. SightreadingFactory.com is an everyday tool for me in my classroom. I am just still, every, even though I use it every day and have for many years now, I'm still finding new and fun ways that I can engage the kids and their music literacy to the point where I feel like I'm having to keep ahead of them to keep them from being bored. That's how quickly they're learning with this tool. So I encourage you to head over to sightreadingfactory.com and use the promo code CORELOSOPHY at checkout to get 10% off when you go to get a membership for yourself and for every single one of your students. Invaluable. Can't plug it enough. And last but not least, RyanMain.com is a place that you can go to find some awesome sheet music written by a self-published, self-sustained composer and conductor clinician, Ryan Main. Got some stuff that kids just love to sing on his website. He also does something unique, which is that once you buy that site license, the PDF comes to you and you can print it and download it as many times as you like. And of course, as always, the perks of being a listener to this show, you can use Coralosophy at checkout at his site as well to get 10% off. Now back to the show. Well, in fact, I, I, I was wondering about the the, t- the constant touching thing that happens in a lot of Latin American cultures and how you feel about that. Because uh, in fact, I, I, I saw a video that you posted a few months back about that topic. And you, I remember you talking about that and spurred an idea in my head, which is that women in the U.S., oftentimes, especially more and more lately, are being told and being taught, kind of socialized, that if someone were to touch you without your permission, that's assault. Mm-hmm. So not only do we not touch each other, uh, we're, t- we're, be- we're teaching young people that to touch each other is inherently sexual and therefore assaulting. We even spoke about this yeah. to a, um, a former student a little bit. We, we said that we referenced 20 your year video. age gap. Yeah. But we referenced you know. your, your video and, and said, um, yeah, you're, you're being taught that you should fear physical touch, but in, in other countries, it's, it's something that's a very normal thing and it's a friendly thing. And it's, it's not, it doesn't have to be an overtly sexual thing. It's just a, Oh, I'm, I'm coming over here to pet your hair, you know? Right. What are your yeah. thoughts about that, that distinction between that culture and ours? It's a, it's very unfortunate. Um, and I, something that I had to get used to, because like you said, so often 
when you're touched by a man as a woman, um, we're, we're just, for some reason, it's ingrained in our head that, ooh, they want you. And that's not the case. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not the case. And it's unfortunate. And, and oftentimes, you know, vice versa. If, if you know, it's come to the fact where if a woman touches a man's shoulder, ooh, they're hitting on you. It's not the case. And because of this, this stigma against physical touch, and it's not just now. Um, I mean, it's been in Western society, in European society for hundreds of years, if not more, mm-hmm. um, that it breaks down this, it, it, one, it presents this, um, in my opinion, this possessiveness that you're only allowed to touch people who are yours or you're in a romantic relationship mm-hmm. or you're family with. And it's this, um, yeah, it's, it's this possessive thing. And then also, um, it, it also is not fair to people who we're in a relationship with. We are starving ourselves for physical inter- interaction, for physical touch. It's, you know, it, 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 it's a village when you, when you care for other people. If you walk up to a friend and pet their head or give them a hug or rub their shoulder just to say hello, that, that gives you a little energetic boost, mm-hmm. an emotional shot of dopamine. Mm-hmm. And if we're only waiting for our spouse or our children to do that, we're, we're becoming um, dependent on one person or two people. And that's not emotionally fair to that person. It puts a big burden mm-hmm. on them to give you all the emotional support that you need. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's very, I think it's, I don't think it's very healthy for our society. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think I, I I largely agree with that. I think that your um, your analysis of of the possessiveness part of it, I think, is dead on. I think it goes back. I mean, I don't, we don't have to make this a history podcast, but it it, it goes it goes <laughs> back to a Protestantism. Um, mm-hmm. there's, there's a lot it of does. there's a lot of things like the early Protestantism. I shouldn't say it. I'm not talking about just anyone who's Baptist. I'm talking yeah. about those early. Uh, Pur- Puritan is, is the word I was looking for. Sorry, um, but uh, yeah, it's that. It's the it, it's when everything in society and culture became um, lo- looking, going on the lookout for someone with ulterior motives. And you know, if you drink alcohol, then it's going to lead you down a path to sin. And you know, it's that whole mindset. But I think it did affect our culture. But uh, but I what what I wonder is how you negotiate the waters where uh, let's say you're a, you, a, what would your advice be for a young woman in the U S let's say a Brazilian person is at your school and he, let's say you're a college undergrad and you get a hug and you didn't ask for this hug. How do you, how do you negotiate those cultural waters without going to the um, campus police? Yeah, I think asking permission is the easiest thing. You know, uh, every time I, I give a hug to someone who I'm an acquaintance with or a former student or something, I say, may I give you a hug or would you like a hug? I never just put my hands on someone very rarely. I mean, unless they're my one of my dearest friends and I'll walk up and hit their back or rub their head or something. I don't do that to someone unless I know them well, especially uh, actually kind of anywhere. But I think permission is the first thing. And if someone, oh, I'll often say, you know, would you like a hand, maybe a handshake um, or a high five, uh, giving options and just asking permission. Right. Um, and also, I think that you, whatever, you, in, I, most people are pretty, are pretty aware of intention. Uh, very mm-hmm. few people are, are unaware of this. So if you honestly are giving love or affection in a platonic way in a in a caring way and not a lecherous way almost everybody on the planet will know and the more you touch people or get touched you start to be able to feel that energy there were people you know who would shake my hand and then kiss my hand in brazil i'm like no no thank you i'm you know and and they'd give you the creepy eyes i'm like i'm leaving thank you very much Right. All right. Because some people do have that intention. But there I, are right. some creepy people. Yes, yes for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Men and women. Yes. There are there are inappropriate people, and it, so so advice is just ask ask if they want it. You know, would you like a hug and and be positive? For yeah, for for Americans, I can definitely see that that is important. Is, is that part of the Brazilian culture too, though, or is it just a walk up and hug each other culture? It is. I, when you meet people, uh, you know, you're walking along the beach and you meet a friend and they're with five of their friends. You go down the line, uh, you know, uh, you kiss each other on the cheek, you give them a hug. 
it's, it's, that's the culture. Yeah. And that's kind of what I was getting at is that they're not asking for permission, but we, Mm -hmm. but we would need someone to, and I think that's kind of my, my point is just how, um, how easily we, we assume that because of the way we do it here, that that is the morally right way to do it. It's not the morally right way. It's just the cultural way mm-hmm. of doing it. So for instance, a handshake is completely appropriate in America. You need right. someone new. Hi, my name is Jacqueline. Right. Yeah, no. And I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that one way I, that is actually, I'm agreeing. Oh, I'm no. agreeing with you that yeah. they're both morally right. It's, I think sometimes we, we tend to assume that our culture is the morally right one. And I'm suggesting, yeah, I'm suggesting maybe we shouldn't, maybe we should look, <laughs> look at, look at any culture's greeting is probably pretty innocuous and not threatening. But I think you're just looking at what the other person agree. is comfortable with, you right. know, like you, mm-hmm. it's you, a negotiation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You err on the side of mm-hmm. making the other person comfortable, you know? Right. So. Well, let's, yeah. let's get back to choir mm-hmm. because what I'm also curious yeah. about is while you were down there and while you were gone away from the classroom and away from teaching and conducting, were there moments where you thought, well, this is kind of a two-part question. Were there moments when you thought, I am done with that forever? <laughs> and were there also moments Me- where you were missing it? Music? Yeah, conducting, teaching, uh, oral. Well, I I knew that I was coming back this spring because I'm doing an honor choir in D.C. and some judging and clinicking gigs. Um, so I knew that I wasn't going to be away from it. Um, it was happy. I was happy to be shifting focus. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I'm, I want, I was needing a break and something different. And so what I did also was fall in love with different types of music. Um, I learned about fojo and different and samba and so different Latin American dances and musical genres. Um, uh, let's see. And so that was a big focus for me while I was down there. Um, not just uh, shifting from Western music, but embracing the Latin American cultures. Le- I was learning um, Portuguese and working on my Spanish, which I was looking forward to being able to bring back into music and my music making when I came back. Okay. So um, did you, were there times um, where you were really feeling your, like, like you had, and I'm not trying to lead you to anything. I'm just trying to get, for, I just know that me, if I, if I was away from the classroom for that long, that period of time, even if I was having a blast, I would, there would probably be some times where I think, man, what am I missing out on? That fear, that fear of missing out on my profession and what I had invested. Did it, did that ever creep in to you? Sometimes. Yeah. When I'd hear a beautiful, I'd see my colleagues and they'd post a beautiful song and I would just sit and listen to it. I'm like, Oh man listen to that intonation. Um, you know, and that, that was it. But I also realized that it's, uh, I, I, that's my favorite part Mm -hmm. is, is the glory of the music. And I'm, I need to figure out how to do that. Um, how to, how to incorporate that because the day to day committee work and endless emails and, uh, you know, being expected to work three jobs to make ends meet while my hospitality professor down the hall is making double than me. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not, co- that was not exceptionally fun. Mm-hmm. I'm like, you know, so, so that part I did not miss. I didn't miss people complaining about me wanting to them, wanting them to work hard. You know, that's, that's something that was heartbreaking for me mm-hmm. is, is seeing how many people and not everybody, of course, not everybody, but how many people just didn't really want to work hard and wanted to, wanted to be great. Mm-hmm. And they, I, I tried to explain to them that it doesn't always work out. You can, there are people who are great and don't have to work hard, but the majority of people have to work hard if you want to be great. Mm-hmm. And they just didn't like hearing that. And, and I got tired of saying it over and over. Right. Well, then what's then what's next? Uh, what is the plan after some of these you know gigs you've got coming up? Do you do you are you wanting to be back to full time at some point? Perhaps I don't know. I um I'm I'm enjoying paving a new path. From what I see, I mean, I'm still clinicking and doing honor choirs, and I I'm not at a university, 
And that's almost unheard of. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's exciting for me. I would really, I've already been writing different presentations on incorporating mindfulness and yoga and, uh, and things into musicianship. I have a presentation on Latin American music from all my travels and previous uh, study because that's a huge passion of mine. So I'd really like to almost transition into lecturing, presenting, and clinicking and, and um, things of that nature. And then in a few years, look at, look at possibly going back to the classroom. But I like sharing knowledge on a huge grand scale because I do feel like I have knowledge that is worthwhile of sharing not just in one single classroom and not just to my 10 music majors, but almost on a global scale Mm -hmm. at this point. I really feel strongly, especially about the mental wellness of musicians. We drive ourselves to it, to the ground. We, we, we revel in our stress and our overworked nature. And that's become a culture that is not healthy in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It, It leads to burnout for the majority of people. Well, yeah, and in fact, that's a that's been a relatively common theme on this show is the mental uh, well being of the choral director. And so, when you when you get that uh, yoga and mindfulness for the choral director material together, you will have a you will have a place to mm-hmm. to hash it out. Because <laughs> I, I would we'd sounds great. Yeah, to me. I would love to love to get my audience involved in that kind of thing too. Because I, I do. Uh, one of the things that motivated this show from starting was just me seeing so many conductors and teachers going on Facebook groups and talking about how miserable they feel like their job is. And you know, I, I can't help but think it has a, some to do uh, with the way their their mindset is approaching the job. Um, because there are, of course, there are places that are better to work than others, of course. Uh, but there, there, there are mindset choices that, like you've been explaining, that we can make uh, to kind of grab control out of our circumstances. That would be, I think, a great resource. Releasing the need for perfection is one. Mm-hmm. And it's terrifying and it's ingrained to us from the beginning of our musicianship to be perfect. And if we're not perfect, we're not worth, it's not worthwhile and it's not good. And it's, uh, it will be looked down upon and as conductors if our product which is our choir isn't good then we're a bad conductor Mm -hmm. you know and and it makes people afraid to try it makes people even even afraid to put themselves out there and even put one foot in front of the other because they're like if it's not perfect right away I can't even I can't even do it Mm -hmm. and that's I mean yeah yeah that's been something I've dealt with 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 my own students too is just talking with them about it's okay to fail it's okay to try and fail and fall down so Sorry, I interrupted. No, that's great. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Um, I'm reading a book called Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. And she oh, talks yeah. about, it's fantastic, about ideas being generated, you know, how ideas come into us and inspiration and a lot of our joy in these ideas and projects and, and, and whatnot are, is, we stop it. We stop doing things we love because we're, we're, we are not, we're, we're trained if it's if we don't win at it if it we don't make money from it mm-hmm. then it's not worthwhile yeah yep. and that we need to i would love to see a shift and th- people just doing things for the joy of it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so yeah. what would be something in your life before you left the classroom that and see how nitty-gritty you're willing to get here with some maybe something about yourself that you were you were pushing yourself to be too perfect at in the classroom because you've, you've everything, everything. Okay. <laughs> everything from the way from, you know, when I did an acapella group from their choreography and costumes to, you know, your fingers aren't the right way to that chord that, you know, we're not using just intonation right now. We're just using the piano equal temperament. We need to really focus on, you know, adjusting that third. I mean, it was to the point of obsession with perfection. And if you have a group that can do it, great. But if not, and you're not, and you're getting frustrated and they're getting frustrated, then you're just beating a dead horse. And there are better ways to come at it to make sure that everything remains joyful and, and it's worthwhile mm-hmm. without the perfection, mm-hmm. quote, perfection. Right. I, I think of it like this. I think in a choral rehearsal, depending on what level of singers you're working with, you can't have all of everything. And you just doesn't matter who you're working with. You can't have everything you want from the sound. And so are you um, are you able to 
let's say throw imagine it were baking can i mix in some perfect intonation sometimes if we can f- figure it out with some of that choreography that you were talking about with some of that all the and still have enough room for the personal growth and joy that has to happen in a choral rehearsal because if you obsess with one of those things too much it's nobody's going to have any fun even if you lock the chord in yeah <laughs> people will still mm-hmm. people will still feel empty after the rehearsal yeah. Yeah. Yep. Do you have any any burning questions from uh, from the Brazil time, Betho? Well, I was just going to say that was more of a cooking analogy than a baking analogy because everything oh, the- is baking <laughs> has to be perfect. Is there a difference? <laughs> yes. But isn't baking, baking also cooking? No, 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 no. Baking what? is like where everything has to be very precise and level, or it won't turn out right. But cooking, you can be more experimental, and you can like add a dash of this and a dash of this. Okay, so you know how rectangles are not squares, but squares are rectangles? Did I say that backwards? Are they? Like, or, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, but like, not, okay. but isn't not, baking uh, also all cooking? Thumbs, no, no, all no. Thumbs no, are fingers, yeah, sure. but not all fingers are thumbs. Yeah, like that. But all I, jacuzzis are hot tubs, but not all hot tubs <laughs> are jacuzzis. Perfect. There yeah, go. perfect. I was thinking But of, the like, reference you were was, making was more towards like, like being a sous chef and not like a baker. Right. Yeah. This is what our life is. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. I can't say anything. I think I just saw Friday That's night at the month's house. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think I, no, I, I stand by my reference. Actually. I think that you could be, cooking while baking, but that's maybe a different podcast episode. Okay. Um, Let's have the, the viewers weigh in and see. Yeah. Maybe say. we'll put a, on like a poll. Yeah. People can yeah. tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> so Jacqueline, the, the let's, let's kind of wrap up with this topic then is as you come back, how long are you back in the States? Is this is it for good or do you have plans to go back to Brazil in the near future? Um, let's see. Well, I want to keep traveling. So I'm here at least until May. And then the goal is to head off again somewhere. Uh, South America is calling me again, but um, I'm looking at either Bali or Italy. I don't know. Wow. I'm, we'll see where I'm called. I have a question. I just thought of one. Was it hard coming yes. back or did you yes. want to stay longer? Did you feel like it was time to come back or? I felt like it was a good time. And of course, once I booked my flight, I stopped getting sick and I was having a great time. So I'm like, darn it. <laughs> um, but, um, but it was good to come back. And the culture shock was incredible. Uh, you know, living with nothing and seeing people who were so happy living with nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone just owns five shirts and a tiny little place to live. And that's, you don't need anything yeah. else. And you come back and a latte is five dollars, and everybody has a five thousand square foot house of stuff. Mm-hmm. Just, oof! So I'm just going through all of my all of my drawers, going, "What can I get rid of? I don't need this. I don't need this." Mm-hmm. That was fun. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So then, if as as you kind of trying to keep yourself on the road, um, what what is your focus? Uh, professionally and, and I've, we've talked a little bit about that already is in terms of you're wanting to incorporate all that you've learned uh in your time away and, in, and through yoga into a uh, what would you say like an evolved version of your choral self is that is that the way you'd think of it absolutely so every every morning i spend two to three hours reading journaling and writing so and i read books i i watch um documentaries or master classes by famous artists. Um, and I, I learn what, what I, I just gather information, uh, mostly about inspiration, about, um, about presenting your art form, about, uh, just different ways uh, of living. And every time I get sparked with an idea, I always write it down. And so that's how all of these presentations and my own philosophies have become to emerge because I spend time every morning um, or every day and uh, just reflecting and absorbing as opposed to just going through the normal routine of giving, giving, giving to other people's like a lot of teachers do. I mean, it's a huge schedule that teacher, teachers have to do. Yeah. Well, okay. So then I'm going to have you, if you if you can, we're going to finish up with a, a thought experiment illustration from you, which would be right. that 
let's picture, or I'd, I'd like you to picture the Dr. Johnson of three mm-hmm. years ago in a choral rehearsal mm-hmm. versus the, the future evolved Yogi Johnson <laughs> in a choral rehearsal. And so let's put those apart, you know, maybe seven years apart as you, as you've started to reach your goals of, uh, of all the things that you're working towards with mindfulness, what do those two choral rehearsals look like and how are they different? They both incorporate the firecracker, you know, Jacqueline Johnson, the just, just engaging and so excited because I, I'm still that person. I'm still so in love with, with teaching. And when we make an amazing change in the sound, I jump around cause I'm so excited and it, it gets the students and the musicians excited too. But what I've also, uh, the future Jacqueline uh, is and will be um, more stable and steady in in the beginning of rehearsal in particular, about setting an intention, setting, uh, bringing people into the rehearsal, uh, opening space like through breathing and focusing exercises to let them just release the stress of the day. I've never had more productive rehearsals in my life than when we start with just seated, closed eyes, breathing, and and focus and intention on bringing it into the classroom. Doesn't matter if they're 17 or 70; they they have a better focus rehearsal. Um, and 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 carrying that beautiful, calm intention through the the rehearsal, so that we we always bring joy and purpose to the rehearsal that transcends just the notes on the page. That sounds beautiful. Mm -hmm. I I think, yeah, I think that's awesome. And it's definitely a laudable goal. Uh, We appreciate you spending any, uh, spending some time with us as you travel. It was pretty uh, daring of you to go tuck yourself away in a car and do a podcast. So we definitely Mm -hmm. appreciate that. (laughs) Do you, uh, Beth, do you have any parting, parting thoughts for Jacqueline? Just thank you for sharing your journey with everybody. I think that, everyone had something to learn from it and and I did as well. And I appreciated you being so vulnerable and open with, with everything you went through. And it was, it was an awesome thing to ex- experience with you. So thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, if you don't follow, you. yeah, if you don't follow Jacqueline on Facebook or, uh, <laughs> to see all of her updates and videos, she is, uh, She's like a, she's got her own traveling podcast, basically. So uh, check her out and, and you'll learn a lot about what, uh, what's going on with her. So thank you, Jacqueline, so much for coming on. Thank you. Have a great day. Everybody. Thank right. you. Bye. So if you want to think of it this way, what you just heard was a little bit of a sequel to the Thanksgiving episode. Uh, I hope if you have not yet listened to that, it's okay to go back and listen to that, even though Thanksgiving is over. There's a lot of valuable stuff in that episode, but it's kind of, this was kind of a sequel because at the very beginning of that episode, I asked you to do the thought experiment of what you would change in your life. And Jacqueline clearly looked at her life and decided something had to change. And I know I admire greatly admire the person who will put their foot down and just change it. So we got to hear the story of somebody who knew that the, the, her work in the classroom was suffering and, and her life, uh, something about her life had to change in order for that to get better. And she went out and did it. So that's impressive, should be lauded. Uh, maybe we wouldn't all go to Brazil to teach yoga in order to change our life, but that's I just thought that was a perfect example and way to follow up that Thanksgiving episode with that conversation so that you could hear that real life example. And again, like I said uh, several times so far, strongly encouraged to get to know Jacqueline if you don't already. She's just a ray of sunshine, awesome person, and great clinician. And she's back now which means that she can do stuff with your kids in your area uh, again. And uh, she might be gone, you know, uh, sometime in the future. So you get her while you can and (laughs) have her come out and work with your choirs because she's an awesome addition to any classroom. So thanks for sticking around to the end of the episode. Um, One of the things that you can do that helps us a lot over here at the Choralosophy Podcast is spreading the word. If you can share an episode, uh, like the episode, Um, rate it on a podcast app that you listen to, even better, leave a comment. All these things are things that help other people who might have not discovered the show to see the show. Uh, Right now, we're hitting a couple thousand downloads per episode, but there's like 30,000 music teachers out there. So you could really help by spreading the word. We'd really like to get more people listening to the show. That'd be an awesome way to further these conversations that we think are so important. Another ways you could help, of course, is you could uh, go to those sponsors. So 
ryanmain.com, graphitepublishing.com, vocevista.com, backslash Coralosophy, and sightreadingfactory.com. Uh, by using the promo code there, it helps the show a lot. It also helps those sponsors uh, that are doing such an awesome thing by putting their name on this show, which is great. And last but not least, if you are really excited about the conversations you hear here and they are valuable to you, then I encourage you to consider going over to patreon.com backslash Coralosophy and chipping in a pledge of up to $3 a month or $3 or more a month, and you can get all kinds of behind-the-scenes content, including a patron-only episode once a month, as well as some, any supplemental materials that I make available for, uh, to patrons only on there. Uh, we're starting to do some live episodes over there. Uh, Patreon people get to know who's coming on the show ahead of time so that they can submit their own questions. We're going to start seeing some of that happen soon. That's a new thing. Uh, so those are all opportunities for you to help me uh, to get the word out about this show, if you feel so inclined or you appreciate that. But at the very least, I'm just glad you're listening. Thank, so thankful for the people who are tuning into this show and making it part of their professional development and part of their thought process. For me, I know I listen to podcasts at the gym. So that's when I am able to kind of go into my thought zen zone. Uh, so whenever it is that you're listening, I appreciate it. Glad to have you aboard. And we'll see you next time. Can you scoot over it all or I'm not? I'm hanging off the edge already. It's hot in here. Can we turn on the fan? Let me just take off your sweater. No. Because no, we can't turn on the fan. It'll make noise. I think it's the light shining on me. Why can't no, we? No, it, the... it does get hot in here. What's you that? You can open the window a little. Um, no, it's also it's an invo inviting noise problems. I'm having fun. Are you? Being with you. I feel really hot. Take off your sweater. It's not going to get better over the course of the time. I don't want, we look matchy. That's right. This is going to make, this part's going to make a great um, outtake. What is? This part right now. You're not going to post this. <laughs> You're not ever. <laughs> Seriously, if you do, I'll kill you. Like, you can't do that. <laughs> you're, com you're comedy gold. Am I? Yeah. Why? Because you're cute and funny. No, just to you. You're not? Just to you. <laughs> <laughs>